Okay, this is a project that we're doing. It's for a customer. Um, he's actually buying a 2x4 black toe and he's gonna be using it for cutting ice. He wants to make perfect ice cubes. Hey Juan, uh, you're about to you're about to run the uh when are you gonna run the project today today oh yeah so what what if it we only have one sheet one right sheet. one shot one opportunity we got one we got one we got one hdpe we got one you gonna lose yourself in the middle the moment you own it you gotta never let it go you only get one shot do not miss your chance to blow this opportunity comes once in a lifetime there you go Slim shady. <laughs> All right, so you got one sheet of HDPE, a single sheet that costs what? Hundred dollars? Uh, no, it was like two. Two something? Two hundred dollars? Two, two, and then. We got one single sheet. It costs two hundred some dollars. Right. What if it? What if the the bit just starts? Take the shit. Just decides to do whatever it wants to do. Um. That's, that's, that's one, a big what if, but uh, you know, I'm double, triple checking, making sure that everything is... It's gonna fuck up your day, isn't it? And if it screws up in the pattern, the, what, the last thing it's gonna do, or is it the first thing it's gonna do? That's the trick, that's, that's, that's the question. I think it has to be the first thing. The first thing? If it screws up the pattern, that's gonna be a big, big portion of the, uh, the, the, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, the material. Right. If it screws up, I'm more, I'm it's more gonna take an entire it. day to run that thing. If it screws up, then we can just flip it. Juan's gonna piss in his. Actually, that, that's a good. That's a good. Uh, that's a good. Uh... Today we're gonna be doing our cutting test on HDPE material. We're gonna making a uh, black toe optional table out of this, which is our two x four CNC machine, and we're gonna do our first cutting test this material the the uh, client requires this to be in a very cold environment the environment is of course there's gonna be ice on the actual table of the machine so it can't be wood unless we coated it but he had a concern about the wood because of potential melting of the ice and getting it all over the the wooden portion of the machine of course he could put polyurethane or coat it Having it in a, in a very cold environment is going to cause some problems because you have wood, which is a very extremely low uh, coefficient of linear expansion, and you have the polyurethane that's coating it, which is a, a very high, relative to the wood, it's a very high coefficient of linear expansion. So those two materials together in an environment that could be cooling and then heating could cause a problem with the adherence to the actual wood and that polyurethane can crack and, and cause problems with the wood allowing uh, some uh, moisture to be seeped in. So he preferred to have an actual table that was completely uh, plastic and, and he uh, preferred HTPE, high density polyethylene. Not only that though, but the, the reason he chose this material is because it was it's related to uh, food uh, consumption. Where, food consumption, okay. Which this material is actually used to, to build a uh, cutting, cutting board. Yeah, because he's going to be putting the ice inside of people's drinks. drinks. Exactly. So, so it wood, requires it, yeah. yeah. You wouldn't want to have uh, wood chips right. <laughs> in your drink. <laughs> right. Well, you probably or wouldn't want. Material, yeah, you wouldn't want HCP to be in the material <laughs> either, but I don't think he's going to be cutting that deep into it. Right now, what we're doing here is we're testing because we've never machined on HTPE before. We don't know what the machine will do on HTPE. We've done many materials. We've with this with the green bowl. We've cut aluminum and obviously wood. We cut acrylic all the time, and acry acrylic is actually kind of difficult because it can gum up if you go too slow. And it, it is a thermoplastic, which means that under higher temperatures, the the material can melt. And a thermoset, the material will just be become brittle if it gets too hot. And HTPE, because of the, uh, it's not a cross-linked uh, polyethylene, it is a thermoplastic, as far as I know. As you can see, it came out pretty good. Uh, you can see the corner um, holes in there. It's another one is, as well. So everything came out really, really nice. I'm very, very happy with it. Okay, uh, we're gonna be cutting another. I want to do another test. I'm gonna go ahead and make the pattern. So I'm gonna have to change the bed, the end mill, then do a, lot, a little test over here. So I did change a couple, uh, couple dimensions on the on the whole pattern for uh, 
for the table. So I'm gonna do another sample, a cutting test sample, and making sure uh, everything is gonna be aligning correctly. We're gonna be using an unshred, uh, unshred bed, quarter inch upcut, single flute. So we're gonna zero the machine right here. We're gonna do the C-axis first. So we need to make sure that the machine is running uh, fast enough so it doesn't overheat and at least slow enough that it has a good surface finish on the edges. Yeah, so the feed rates came into uh, consideration on, on uh, the melting and, and of the material. and Right. Now how many passes did you do on the, the cutting? Mm -hmm. You did some test cuts? I did. I tried, uh, I think I went up to, uh, I want to say, one eighth depth at the beginning. Okay, so in the beginning you did one eighth of uh, depth per pass. So per pass, yeah. it would take seven passes to go through? Yeah, roughly. Yeah, because yeah, we're then, going through yeah. three quarters of an inch. We're using an onshrewed um, bit here, which is a single flute. We love the single flute onshrewed bits. Mm -hmm. and They're this called Super O. Yeah, this one is uh, mm -hmm. the same end mill we used to actually cut aluminum as well. Yeah. And we do all our, our regular MDL plywood cuts as well with the same end mill. And we also cut plexiglass with this one. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it has It's a good universal yeah. Yeah, end mill. It's, it's very universal and it works really well for us. Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes to expense, obviously, you don't want to be, you want a, an end mill that's going to last you a good amount of time and, uh, and it does, and it serves really well for us. What speed are you running the, what actual IPM, inches per minute are you running each feed rate? I think I went up to uh, 115 inches per minute per okay. pass. 115 uh, inches? And, uh -huh. and then the... And the finishing pass? And then the finishing pass, I think I went to up to 120 inches per minute. Okay, and you did. You said you initially did the finishing passes, multiple passes, but did you finally just decide on doing a single pass? On the on the on the like actual full, full depth. Yeah. No, I never did that. Actually, I think I went up to 0.3, okay. 0.3 depth on for the finishing. For, no, for the finish for the finishing pass, I did want a full depth. Okay, full yeah. depth. Yeah. Yeah, full depth. Okay, you can but, see there's a lot of chips on the on the mm -hmm. table too. And I think that's the back end one. The back end was off at the time. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to ch check that as well. Make sure, you know. Right. We get a good... Um, yeah, the, the having the vacuum light. off uh, allows us to kind of look at the chips, see if the machining is, is being uh, performed correctly also. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, the temperature of the end mill came up. Uh, it's, it's also important. So mm -hmm. it doesn't melt the material as it's cutting. It's just actually trying to cut it. Yeah. So it doesn't so you come up the... The, the end mill and then it will it will it will damage your material if it comes up yeah and eventually could break the end mill as well so that's the problem if it goes too slow it'll do a couple things it will uh, stick to the edge of the piece that it's cutting the the actual um, final piece and then it'll um, also potentially get into the end mill um, causing the end mill to be less efficient mm -hmm. and less effective Everything looks good so far, so if everything checks out correctly, what I'll, the only thing I have to do is maybe modify the finishing passes, maybe reduce a couple passes on, on the finishing portion of it. The end mill is not hot at all, so that's good. So that's one of the concerns that we had with, for the uh, the feed rate on, on the machine. So we were thinking about that. So the melting point of, of, the, of the material. So we were, we were concerned about that, how fast we can do it, um, how slow, you don't want to go too slow because then you're melting the material at that point. Just took them out of the, kept the holding tabs. The holding tabs uh, are just little things right here. This is the method that we use to remove the holding tabs from the pieces that come out of the CNC machine. We just use a standard router with a a bearing on the top to guide it along the edge of the piece and we have the holding tab on the bottom of that portion so it can remove the holding tab completely and leave that edge completely smooth. We also added a brush to contain the chips and a vacuum to evacuate the chips as we're removing these tabs. One of the things you have to do once you change the end mill and you're using two different end mills in one file. The only thing you need to worry about zeroing will be the C axis because it's obviously gonna change the height of the of whatever you position the the end mill regarding the col the collet to the tip of the of the to the tip of the end mill. So so if, if you were gonna put this end mill, which is would if it were to be a little bit shorter, then your C axis will be all offset, and that that's just one thing that you have to keep in mind that you're gonna be doing once you change end mills. Always check your C axis. Uh, zero you see axis after you change any type of end mill you might be positioning the end mill sometimes at different points and it's never gonna be the same when you change that manually look right there might be too close there but i'm 
basically on top of the material. So now I come to Mach 3. As you can see, my zero, my C axis will be changed. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the brush to the vacuum. We'll get some of that stuff while we're cutting. Put there, align these two screws, thumb screws right here. There's one more in the back. Vacuum, ready to go. We're gonna be cutting the pattern for the black toe uh, HDPE material. A black toe is, we will be a two by four. So we're gonna be cutting the pattern. Right now we're gonna go up to one eighth on depth. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be starting right now. So wish me good luck. Okay, here we are. We're actually doing the most risky portion of this project, which is these diagonal lines, uh, grooves that we're putting into the HDPE to uh, maintain the position of the ice during its machining. So we have a lot of lines to, to put on this board and there's a lot of opportunity for the machine to stall or, or whatever that could happen during this very long procedure. Fortunately we didn't have any problems. No we didn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah so we were pretty happy with the results. Yeah it was, it was plenty of lines in there. Not only you know um, messing up uh, the material when it came to the machine uh, working on the material, but also the design portion of it with the, the cam, you know, making sure that everything turned out to be okay and no mistakes on that portion as well. So that kind of, um, cause it was a lot of lines to go through if you wanted to, to go into details when, you know, zooming in every single line in the cam pro process of it. So you kind of have to, uh, trust that as well, or you could have spent a lot of time making sure that those lines were, uh, done correctly. Yeah, and even what I'm noticing is it's crisscrossing. It's not just one set of diagonal lines. It's two sets of diagonal lines crisscrossing. So <laughs> you, in the machining process, you have, it's gonna be going through material, then not no material, then through material. So you're putting kind of an, an interesting type of stress on the machine that I don't think we've ever really experienced because we don't do this type of machining. So it's gonna be, you know, um, soft, hard, soft, hard, soft, hard, soft, hard as it goes through. And you know, this is what the customer wanted, so we had to do it. And uh, we're making these these sort of diamond patterns. Obvi obviously, it's you know they're squares, but they're diamonds. But it's a pr it looks really good when it's done. It, it's a very pretty good. result. And they they were really uh, the, the the quality of the cut, right? The the detail on it it was it was pretty. I was really really happy with it. And then, uh, not only you talked about you know going from cutting and stopping and cutting, you know, I was maybe also thinking about, you know, the results of each corner of each single block, maybe chipping or, or having some sort of a, mm -hmm. uh, imperfection when it comes to every single block. Right. Because of the stopping and cutting, stopping and cutting. Every single corner, I, I was, you know, maybe. Um, you also had to find the right feed rate mm -hmm. to make sure you have a really good quality of an edge in that diagonal pattern mm -hmm. as well. I think the testing helped us out. You know, yeah. know, knowing what what that should be. Yeah, and that's also you know essential for when you're trying out you know, new material, obviously. But we're doing lettering now, which is the build your CNC. See, it's just essentially doing outlines of the of the letters. To do the lettering, we actually do two processes. We have a, a pocketing to do everything inside of the letter, inside of the font. But we also we do a finishing pass of an inside profile so we can get all of those little small areas that were missed with the uh, with the pocketing uh, procedure and that for fonts i think that's that's the way we've been doing it and then it, it looks really nice yeah we get great results well th this is also where we're using the eighth inch bit right yes uh so we choose to use a one eighth uh, diameter bit to do the the logo because it was fairly small, so should be saying end mill, really. End mill, right? Yeah. And that's to so, do the logo, yeah, because yeah. you, you have to have your fonts large enough to be able to get detail into it, but you're a bit small enough so you can obviously get the detail. Right. You don't want to overwhelm the piece. I mean, you already have, and the customer was, you know, I don't I don't know if we asked him or not, but we did it anyways. We just, we just put our logo on there. Yeah, we're, we just, we're, like, we're marking our we territory. Just, yeah, we're branding our, everything. We, t we tried to do that. We tried to, you know. Yeah, well, we gotta we gotta market somehow. Yeah, we, we're a we, small company. Yeah, we tried to. We we take pride in what we do, and I, we believe that, you know we did a, a, you know, a pretty pretty damn good job. 
yeah on this uh request from this customer so we feel confident enough to put our brand it looks like we're doing the um the pocketing last after the actual outline no i think i think it does i think it starts in the middle okay and then it works its way out no but i was talking about just that one area on the outside the uh one of those sort of those thicker grooves because I saw some material left inside. So I think maybe we're doing doing it, yeah, doing it like that. Right now we are basically drilling the holes for the for the space of where the ribs and the rails are gonna be attached to the tabletop. So that's what we're doing there. And then um, yeah, you can see all the holes. Oh my god, that's a lot of holes. So that's yeah. the, the back, uh, the underneath. Uh, what do you call um, ribs? Yeah. Support. And those are the fronts and the backs. Uh -huh. So yeah. that's where the chain uh, ends right. and begins on the opposite side. And then um, to do an adjustment, tension uh, adjustment in there. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, well, yeah, I mean, those cuts came out pretty good. Uh, it was really, really nice and smooth. Uh, I mean, the material is fairly soft, so. Watch out. Bust it. I'm not eating yet. I'm just looking at it. Can you help me check this out? So as you can see, we finished the table. Everything looks good. No mistakes. You had the Stop vacuum perfect. going at the time, right? I think, yeah. Yes, it, I did. It pretty much picked up all the chips. You can see some on the side, but I think that was from the previous attempts without the vacuum, right? Yeah, I, th I think during the uh, during the um, the pattern, I, I had uh, the brush uh, removed. Okay. But it, you know, I mean, it was just for filming purposes, and so it, it could give you a better uh, visual of how the, you know, the end mill goes through there. Mm -hmm. through the mater material <coughs> after everything gets done the way we keep the material in place when we're cutting we're using uh holding tabs to keep the material the, the profiles in place so we cut we cut uh we cut the holding tabs and this material should be free just one side got clean that looks that looks really really cool see so, yeah looks pretty cool huh yeah so clean That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. It's really nice. We got the long ribs. It's gonna go it's underneath heavy. the table. It's heavy. Mm -hmm. It's heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy. So we got four, four of these. This will be the uh, chain mounts with the uh, support as well for the structure of the table underneath. So we a black tub. This music is going to be tricky. It's pretty heavy. I'm very happy with the results. I'm just going to trim those holding tabs. And then we're going to dry, do a dry fit, making sure everything is aligning correctly. And then we should be ready for, uh, for shipping. The next process, if you will, uh, is to remove those holding tabs. And we use a jig. Yeah, we, we, we've essentially developed here, but it's just a, a router that's mm -hmm. mounted to the bottom. And I did it with a Lazy Susan because we have a lot of long pieces in it. And it helps when the mechanism turns rather than you actually turning the piece to maintain its position on the the router bit and when you're doing that process you want to think about safety you know it keeps it allows at least your hands to be as far away from that from that the, uh, router bit as possible Juan actually designed the brush that goes above the 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 router bit what it does it has a plexiglass top so you can actually see what you're doing it has a brush that goes around the perimeter of that that still allows the material to go under the brush and maintain as much barriered area so the chips do not go out of that area and also 
you know, you try to put the brush as, you know, surrounding as much as possible. We probably could have done almost all of it, but I think for the very small pieces, it would be really difficult because of safety where your fingers are. So you wouldn't be able to see where your fingers are. And you need to be able to see that, obviously, to, so you don't chop your fingers off. And then you have a vacuum on the top that, that evacuates all the chips, that, that sucks up all the chips. And, and it does an, an amazing job. I mean, you can see all of the chips being sucked up by the vacuum and nothing is really left on the table. Yeah, that's true. And then uh, it worked really well. And then, um, yeah, then the plexiglass also, uh, you know, helps you see through through what you're actually uh, writing, uh, taking the material off and mm -hmm. make, you know, safety-wise, it makes, makes more sense to actually see uh, where your fingers and the material is located at. Right. At all times. Okay, that was the uh, uh, video on cutting HDPE uh, with the green bull uh, for a client that is cutting ice in Miami. Thank you so much for watching.